Welcome. Welcome. If I could get you to, if I could have everybody take their seat, please. Can you hear me okay? Is that on now? Not on. Okay. Well, let's try this one. Can you hear me now? Okay. Could I ask everybody to please get seated and uh, so we can get started? Great. Well, welcome. Uh, on behalf of John Hamry, our president, and I'm Rick Barden, the co director of the Post Conflict Reconstruction Project with Karen von Hippel and a member of the CSIS Commission on Smart Power. As many of you know, the Smart Power Commission that Joe Nye and Rich Armitage chaired uh, was really an effort that CSIS undertook to renew, restore, and really rebuild U.S. influence in the world by wisely, wisely using America's diverse strengths. So it's a great pleasure today to welcome the dean of our field, Ambassador Jim Dobbins, to this 25th Smart Power Speaker event. Uh, Jim was wondering why there was such a good crowd. It must be the anniversary, Jim, or as well as your star power. Um, the, we ha we've, I've had the opportunity over the years to work with Jim on Haiti, uh, the Balkans, and to exchange views on Afghanistan and Iraq, and, and have always found him to be informed, strategic, operational, and concerned with results. Since joining Rand, he's been one of the most important communicators of critical arguments from the U.S. efforts in Japan and Germany to the U.N.'s indispensable role in peacekeeping and peacebuilding. His combination of talents and experience has made him an indispensable and influential force here in Washington. Jim is an intellectually demanding colleague and so we are looking forward to his remarks today as, as he helps to prepare us for a future where conflict will be present and the U.S. role needs definition. After his remarks, Jim and I will uh, conduct a, a very brief conversation and then invite the rest of you to be part of that conversation as well. And so, Jim, the floor is yours. Thanks. Please help me in welcoming you, Jim. Well, thank you very much, Rick, and thanks to you and John for inviting me to this uh, prestigious uh, series. I, I'd love to be thought either uh, smart or powerful, and the idea of being both is uh, particularly flattering. Um, you know, anyone uh, observing the American performance in Iraq over the first year or so of the occupation could be forgiven for thinking this was the first time we'd ever done something like this. Uh, it was one uh, unanticipated uh, challenge after another. It was one improvised response after another. Uh, in fact, as, as you know, it wasn't the first time. In fact, it was the seventh time in little more than a decade that the United States had to help liberate a society and then tried to rebuild it. So in 1991, we went into Kuwait. Uh, and then uh, over, the sub over the following decade, we went into Somalia, into Haiti, into Bosnia, into Kosovo, into Afghanistan, and finally into Iraq. And of those seven societies, six are Muslim. The only one of those seven societies that the United States helped build, rebuild over that period that's not Muslim uh, is a Haiti. So when the American army went into Iraq in 2003, there was no army in the world with more experience in nation building. And there was no Western army in the world with more experience uh, operating within a Muslim society. So you do have to ask yourself how we could do this so often and yet do it so badly. Uh, and the answer, of course, was that we weren't taking this seriously. We didn't regard it as a core mission. Uh, and as the result, we weren't becoming more professional despite the frequency with which we were being called upon to do this. Now, since coming to RAND uh, in 2002, um, uh, we've spent some time looking back over uh, the last 60 years at the American experience, at the experience of others in this field, to determine what lessons we learned or what lessons we should have learned um, uh, from, these, uh, from these experiences. Um, and I'm going to talk today on the basis of a series of studies uh, that we've done, 
Uh, the first was called America's Role in Nation Building, and it looked at the American experience. Second was called the UN's Role in Nation Building. It looked at the UN's experience. Another volume, which is coming out in a couple of weeks, is called Europe's Role in Nation Building, and it looks at the European experience in this regard. Um, for the United States, nation building, as we currently know it, really began um, in Germany in the uh, immediate aftermath of the Second World War. This is still the gold standard for nation building and set, uh, uh, and set a, a record that's been difficult and impossible, in fact, to match. Um, now, many people would uh, reject uh, Germany as a, as a valid model for um, uh, the conduct of subsequent missions on the grounds uh, that Germany, after all, um, was a uh, Western society with some experience with democracy uh, and surrounded by other democracies. Um, and uh, those certainly were significant advantages. What's interesting is that uh, Japan uh, had none of those advantages. Uh, it wasn't a Western society. It wasn't surrounded by other democracies. It didn't have significant experience with democracy. And yet Japan's transformation went uh, even more quickly um, uh, and even more easily uh, than Germany's. And in both cases, we demonstrated that nation building, which we've defined in our series as the use of armed force in the aftermath of a conflict to promote uh, a, a sustainable peace and representative government, that nation building uh, can work, that you can use armed force, you can compel a society to change in some fundamental ways, and that those changes will endure after the element of compulsion is removed. It doesn't prove you can always do it, or you doesn't prove you can do it in all circumstances, it just means that it is a feasible objective in some, in some circumstances. Um, during the Cold War, uh, uh, this particular paradigm uh, wasn't frequently replicated. During the Cold War, the main imperative was to maintain an equilibrium with the Soviet Union without allowing any particular crisis to escalate to the level of a superpower conflict. And therefore, crises te conflicts tended to be suppressed rather than resolved. So during the Cold War, Berlin remained divided, Germany remained divided, Europe remained divided, Cyprus remained divided, Palestine remained divided, Korea remained divided, China remained divided. And in every one of those cases, either American or UN troops were used to maintain those divisions, to prevent those disputes from being resolved, because if they were resolved, they would have redounded to the benefit of one superpower or the other, and the other superpower wasn't going to permit that. So peacekeeping during the Cold War was essentially about interposing yourself and preventing conflicts from getting worse rather than resolving the underlying uh, difficulties. With the end of the Cold War, that imperative went away and nation building became a growth industry. Uh, for the United States, for instance, during the Cold War, the United States intervened in another country on an average of about once every 10 years. Uh, since, uh, since the end of the Cold War in the Clinton administration, that went from once every 10 years to once every two years. She had Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo over a more or less an eight year period. Bush came into office saying he wasn't gonna do it anymore and he invaded three new countries in the first three years in office. So we went into Afghanistan, Iraq, and by the way, we went back into Haiti in 2004. The UN's acceleration is even more frequent. The UN uh, initiated a new peacekeeping operation on the average of once every four years for the first 45 years of its existence. And then since 1990, it's initiated a new peacekeeping operation every six months. So from once every four years to once every six months. And these are cumulative commitments. Um, these operations uh, uh, were lasting two or three years in the early 90s. That often proved too short. Uh, by the end of the 90s, the average one was lasting five to six years. Today, they're often lasting eight to 10 years. So if you're doing one every two years, like the United States, pretty soon you're doing four or five. In 2004, the US had troops in Kosovo, in Bosnia, in Haiti, in Afghanistan, and Iraq. Five missions all at the same time. And the UN, if you're doing one every six months, pretty soon you're doing a couple of dozen. And today the UN is doing 20 different peacekeeping operations with about 100,000 uh, uh, soldiers and police deployed, which is incidentally larger than NATO, the EU, and every European government combined. So this is a significant burden on the uh, international system. Now, um, during the, the 90s, the US began to relearn um, uh, how to do these kinds of operations. And you did see a steady progression from Somalia, which was a, a, 
across the board failure, to Haiti, which was uh, uh, not pursued long enough to have an enduring result, but was successful within the, the limited time frame that was set for it, uh, to Bosnia, uh, uh, to Kosovo. Um, and there were lessons that were learned and integrated during this period. In Somalia, one lesson we learned was that uh, unity of command can be as important in a uh, peace operation as in a conventional wartime operation. The Black Hawk Down incident and the failure to, to render timely rescue for the downed, um, uh, uh, for, the, for, the, for the stranded rangers and special forces was in part a failure of command, a un uh, the lack of unity of command. The only units that could affect the rescue were the UN units. They hadn't been part of the operation, weren't briefed on it, didn't know it was taking place, and it took a long time to organize them deploy them and uh, effectuate the rescue. Um, we learned in Somalia that, um, uh, that uh, there's an important correlation between the size of the force you deploy and the scale of the operation you envisage uh, between mission and level of commitment. We put a large force into Somalia, 20,000 soldiers and Marines, with a very limited objective, which was to, um, to protect humanitarian food and medicine supplies, no other objectives, and then we reduce that force from 20,000 soldiers and Marines to something like 2,000, and we gave that residual force the mission of supporting a UN-led grassroots democratization campaign that was going to infuriate it, every warlord in the country. It was a wild mismatch between soaring ambitions and plummeting capabilities that caught up with us very quickly. Uh, and finally, we learned in Somalia um, that uh, the milita a military deployment opens a window of opportunity, but it doesn't effectuate the underlying changes that make that deployment worthwhile. And that if you don't deploy civilian capabilities, people who know how to uh, promote civil society, create a free press, organize elections, and rebuild the economy, that window will eventually close and nothing will have changed. We also learned some pernicious lessons in Somalia, however, ones that affected subsequent missions negatively. If you remember back to that time frame, the body, American body politic took the lessons of Somalia wars that you had to avoid mission creep, uh, set a departure deadline, and have an exit strategy. Um, and these um, uh, lessons uh, impacted on subsequent missions. And it was precisely for these reasons that the mission in Haiti was so circumscribed that in the end, uh, it achieved nothing of enduring value. By the time we got to, Kosovo, to Bosnia, President Clinton hadn't learned not to set a departure deadline, but he had learned not to keep it. Uh, and so he went in, he promised to be out in a year, but in the end of the year he admitted we hadn't achieved our objectives and we ended up staying uh, for 10. And by the time we got to Kosovo, the same people were doing this within the administration. They argued who paid for what. Most of these issues had been settled. The division of labor among agencies had been pretty much worked out. And it was the smoothest of the operations in terms of both uh, uh, managing the U.S. government process, but also managing the NATO and, and, inter and, uh, and uh, international uh, processes. Uh, th th these, uh, th this learning curve did not carry over to the new administration. Um, uh, the, uh, the new administration came into office disinclined to take nation building seriously, disinclined to do it at all, and when forced to do it, uh, 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 were insistent on adopting a very different approach. Um, in, in Afghanistan, the approach was uh, low profile, small footprint, and, and the basic lesson that one can draw from Afghanistan is uh, low input, low output. That is, if you apply low levels of military manpower and economic assistance in a post-conflict environment, what you get are low levels of security and economic growth. And that's pretty much the story we saw for the first couple of years until this strategy was revised and until substantial increases in both manpower and money were applied to the process. Um, in Iraq, the uh, desire to do things differently was even uh, uh, more manifest. Um, uh, the small put footprint, low profile approach uh, was tried. Uh, and perhaps uh, the greatest departure from uh, prior practice was the decision to take responsibility for all the non-military elements of nation building away from the agencies of government that had been doing it for 50 years maybe never terribly well, but increasingly better through the 90s, and give them all to the Department of Defense, an agency that had no, response, no, no, no uh, experience whatsoever in any of these fields, uh, at least since 1952 when the German and Japanese occupations ended. The result, of course, was 
the exercise in heroic amateurism that we saw with the coalition provisional authority in which thousands of, of dedicated, um, uh, courageous, and for the most part rather young uh, Americans flooded into Baghdad to take positions for which many of them had no qualifications whatsoever. Um, uh, the, uh, the organization was never more than 50% staffed. The average tenure was three months. What that meant is of six positions, three were vacant. One was filled by someone who'd just gotten there. One was filled by someone who was about to leave. And so maybe one position in six had someone who'd been there long enough to know what he was doing and wasn't just about to leave. It's a miracle that as much was achieved during this period as was, given these structural difficulties. Um, so that's the uh, U.S. experience to date. Now we also did a second volume that looked at the U.N. experience, and we took eight cases uh, and compared those to the eight cases that I talked about in the U.S. case. And the ones we looked at in the U.N. case were uh, Namibia, Cambodia, Mozambique, El Salvador, uh, East Timor, Eastern Slavonia, uh, Sierra Leone, and one other that I've forgotten for the moment. Um, uh, and, and we went through a similar effort to describe and draw lessons from those. And at the end of that volume, we compared the US and UN experiences, um, and, uh, and, and in particular looked at, uh, at the success rates. And in that volume, we established several measures of success. Uh, the two most important were security um, and uh, democracy. Basically, the question was, and it was a binary choice, um, uh, is, uh, it, it, has civil war returned, or is the place uh, at peace today when we wrote? And the second question was, um, is, the, is it being governed by a, a, a freely elected govern, government or not? And for that, we didn't make our own decisions. We just went to Freedom House, who rate every government in the world, sort of from 1 to 10, and we took their ratings. Uh, the U.S. Uh, success rate at that point was 50-50. Uh, was that is, four, uh, four cases, uh, four of the eight uh, societies involved were peaceful and democratic, and four weren't, or weren't yet. So the four that were were Germany, Japan, uh, Bosnia, and Kosovo, and the four that weren't or weren't yet were Somalia, Haiti, um, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Uh, the UN success rate, when we did the same uh, calculation, um, oh, the other case that I forgot, the eighth case, was the Belgian Congo back in the 1960s, that, which was the first UN experience in the nation building. So the UN uh, success rate on, uh, on peace was seven out of eight. The one that wasn't peaceful when we wrote uh, in 2005 was the Congo. But the Congo had been peaceful for 30 years after the UN left, so it wasn't a negligible achievement even if it wasn't uh, completely enduring. You wouldn't think, given the countries I'd mentioned, that their rating on democratization would be very high. It was actually six out of eight. Six out of eight of those places are being governed by uh, freely elected governments, which Freedom House rates as more democratic than not. The, the, the other one besides the Congo that wasn't was Cambodia. Now, why did the US, UN score higher than the US on this particular quiz? Um, there's a number of explanations, and one of them, of course, is case selection. We didn't pretend that ours was a, either a complete selection of cases or a scientifically selected sample. So you can't really judge that they're, that, uh, them against each other. The second, uh, it was also important, the U.S. cases were more difficult. They were bigger. They were peace enforcement rather than peacekeeping. Uh, in several cases, the U.S. went in only after the U.N. had failed. But there was a third reason, which is equally valid and maybe more important because it's one you can do something about, and that was the UN was doing better because it was taking this mission more seriously. Peacekeeping, peace, uh, peace building is their core mission. It's their lead product. It's the one they do best in. It's the one they devote the most resources to. Um, and as a result, they had been doing what we weren't doing. They were developing a, a, a doctrine based on a, a, a crude experience and they were uh, developing a cadre of experts who could go from one, from one mission uh, to the other. Um, the, uh, now, looking you know, beyond those initial experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq at the American performance, uh, I, I think one would have to say that, that we've again seen a learning curve, that the U.S. government is taking this mission much more seriously, and it's doing a better job uh, as a result. Um, uh, we can see that it's taken more seriously 
first in the fact that the Department of Defense has established what they call stability operations as a core mission for the U.S. military. Uh, Bill Clinton would have been impeached if he tried to do that in the mid-90s, given the resistance to nation building. But by, uh, by, by the current decade, this became a feasible, um, a, a feasible step. The State Department finally created an office, having done seven of these over the last 15 years, finally created an office uh, that was supposed to improve uh, its performance uh, and, and create a doctrine and create a cadre of experts. Um, and the president, uh, uh, having uh, done away with the Clinton administration era interagency structure for managing these, issued a directive establishing a new interagency structure for managing future such operations. More importantly, you can see in the performance of both the civil and military actors in uh, both Iraq and Afghanistan that uh, we've adopted more sophisticated counterinsurgency tactics, that we're uh, much more successful at integrating civil and military components of the operation, that we're deploying much larger and, uh, uh, and better equipped civilian capability in those situations. And so there has been uh, uh, improvements uh, over this uh, period. Um, now, the question, of course, is how enduring this will be. Um, if the uh, Bush administration's reaction to the early failures in Afghanistan and Iraq are, we have to do this better next time, it's not clear to me that that's the reaction of most Americans or most American legislators who are more likely to think we shouldn't do it again next time rather than that we should do it better again next time. And so there is a real danger that we will go through the kind of post-Vietnam never again syndrome. In that case, we promptly forgot everything we'd learned about counterinsurgency warfare, uh, actually actively suppressed it, took it out of the curriculum and the war colleges, um, and, and, and reoriented our training and thinking toward missions that we were more comfortable with. Um, and it's not impossible that, um, that the, the reaction to sort of Iraq and Afghanistan uh, would, uh, would have a, a similar effect. Um, that would be too bad uh, if it occurs, because while the failures tend to linger in the popular imagination, the successes in this kind of activity are, in fact, far more numerous. Um, uh, but, you know, for every, uh, for every American who knows what the, US, what the UN accomplished in, um, in Namibia or Mozambique uh, or El Salvador in the early 90s, there are 100,000 who've seen Black Hawk Down. For every European, uh, there are thousands who watched Unperfor fail progressively uh, in uh, Bosnia over a period of years and remember Srebrenica and Rwanda. So these are the, these are the images that tend to populate um, our knowledge base about uh, the success of nation building and peacekeeping. Uh, but the fact is um, that, uh, uh, that the uh, record is actually fairly good and that there are tens of millions of people today living in places like, um, like the ones I've named, like Namibia, like Mozambique, like Cambodia, like El Salvador, like uh, Albania, like um, Macedonia, like Bosnia, like Kosovo, um, like Sierra Leone, like Liberia, like East Timor, who are living at peace today, and for the most part, in every one of those countries except Cambodia, living under freely elected governments, because uh, UN or American or NATO or European troops came in separated the combatants, disarmed the contending factions, uh, helped rebuild the economy, promoted civil society, organized elections, and then stayed around long enough to make sure that the resultant governments could take hold and begin to, uh, uh, to function uh, effectively. Um, the statistics bear out the success of this kind of activity. Um, you know, Americans tend to look back at the Cold War sort of nostalgically. Well, you know, it was kind of scary, but it was really stable and rather peaceful. Well, maybe it was for us, but it wasn't for most of the world. The fact is that the superpower competition fueled dozens of proxy wars around the world in places like Angola and Mozambique and Cambodia um, and El Salvador and Nicaragua that killed millions of people, sometimes millions of people every year, um, certainly hundreds of thousands of people every year throughout this period. And much of that continued into the early 90s. But as the result of international activism um, and the new international circumstances, the number of conflicts actually dropped by more than 50% between 
1993 and 2003. So you went from a world in which there were 60 civil, mostly civil wars of one size or another, to less than 30. And the, and the drop in the number of casualties that were resulting from those conflicts was even sharper. Uh, and what's absolutely amazing, given what we see every day in Afghanistan and Iraq and Darfur, is that those drops have continued. Not perhaps as sharply, but from 2003 to 2006, there was a continued reduction in the number of conflicts and a reduction in the number of people getting killed in the conflicts. And the reductions came mostly in, in sub-Saharan Africa, which happens to be the place that the UN is the principal uh, actor. So, so this kind of activity has played, has, has uh, had significant benefit. Now, I'll conclude by noting th uh, that we've uh, recently written and will be publishing uh, in uh, a month or so another study which uh, is called After the War, Nation Building from FDR to George W. Bush. And that study looks at how um, presidential personality interagency structure and decision-making processes affect the outcomes. Um, and the conclusion of that study is that some administrations are better than others at doing this, but that all of them get better over time. And then all too often that improved performance doesn't transition to their successor. That there are, there are abrupt discontinuities in acquired expertise as the result of presidential transitions, particularly when they're accompanied by party transitions. So if you're looking for a place to fix American performance, the place to fix it is at the point of transition. You know, bad as this administration was, it's gotten significantly better. And if we toss out everything that it has achieved and learned, uh, when a new admi administration replaces it, we're likely to repeat many of those mistakes again in some different guise. And so there are a number of steps that I think can be taken to improve the transition process. First of all, in terms of specifics, I think that the next administration should try to retain the reforms that the, this administration has introduced. <clears throat> the, 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 the directive that makes stability operations a core mission of the US military, the new office in the State Department that's supposed to professionalize their performance in this regard. Uh, if, they, if they don't want to keep Bush's interagency structure, immediately replace it with another one, not just leave a five-year gap during which there's no formal structure for preparing for these kinds of operations in the future. Um, and similarly, the improved performance in the field uh, that we've seen in both Iraq and Afghanistan needs to be sustained, whatever the political decisions are regarding the level of uh, of engagement. I think there are also some longer term reforms that would help fix this uh, transition gap, if you will. Um, uh, one of them, uh, it will be controversial and difficult, but I think it's important, um, would be to require that a certain proportion, maybe 50%, I don't have a particular proportion in mind, but some proportion of sub-cabinet jobs and White House staff positions should be career and shouldn't change when the president changes. Um, and this would a, a, a introduce an element of continuity across administrations at that crucial staff and sub-cabinet level. A second uh, reform would be to introduce uh, in the civilian agencies what the military has already introduced. In the military, to get promoted to a general officer rank, you have to have served outside your own service in a joint position or with another service. And a similar requirement that said if you want to be promoted to the far senior foreign service or senior executive service um, uh, in any national security agency, you have to have served one tour in some other agency. I think would again improve our performance, um, our performance in this uh, in this regard. And um, and I think the the other change which probably has to be introduced through legislation is some effort to regularize and make more enduring the basic division of labor between the, the executive agencies of government. We can't continually uh, 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 alter uh, the, the basic uh, functions that these agencies are supposed to do in these kinds of circumstances or they'll never have an incentive to get better at it. You know, during the Clinton administration, nation building was unfashionable, Congress didn't like it, and the US military ran away from it. And so 
the division of labor that existed in places like Bosnia and Kosovo was that the US military would do peacekeeping very narrowly defined but everything else was left to the State Department so if you wanted to train the Croatian or the Bosnian armies that was a State Department job Defense Department had nothing to do with training those armies the State Department did it it used retired military personnel to do it but it was a State Department program if you wanted to train and, and run the police departments that was a State Department job if you wanted to protect local dignitaries, that was a State Department job. And of course, State and AID did all of the economic uh, development. We then got to Afghanistan, where the Bush administration made the decision that we weren't going to do any peacekeeping, but the US military would build the army, uh, it would build the police force, it would protect Hamid Karzai, and it would build roads and, and dig, dam uh, dig wells and, and build schools. So you went from one administration where the military did nothing but peacekeeping to another administration where it did everything except peacekeeping. And, uh, you know, this was a wild disjunction in terms of agency responsibilities. Then when you got to Iraq, you went one step further and turned all civilian responsibilities over to the Department of Defense. Um, and then, of course, a year later, they turned them back over to the State Department. So, you know, given this level of uncertainty, you know, no agency is going to uh, take the long-term steps to develop a cadre of people who know how to do this whose careers are structured around doing it, who are rewarded for doing it, who are put in a system that makes them available to do it again, and to make the other investments. So I do believe that, um, that we need uh, uh, probably legislation because uh, executive orders will, will probably not outlive their, um, their presidencies that establishes some basic decision, division of labor between state, defense, um, uh, AID and other agencies as to who's responsible for what functions in these kinds of situations. And it's actually less important exactly what that division of labor is than that it's clearly established and not likely to change. So those are the kinds of uh, proposals I would suggest as we head into a transition and as we try to retain some of the hard-earned uh, lessons uh, that we have learned uh, over this uh, last decade and, and over the much longer period. Thank, Thank you. you, Rick. Let me, uh, let me start off by asking the first couple of questions, and then if you just uh, start waving your hands, then we'll get people with microphones around to you. Um, Jim, I think that you've, you've left open the question of whether the next administration, um, from either your early reading of their comments during these, the campaign or their advisors or whatnot, will take this issue on as a central mission of the United States or whether it will be something that will be treated as a continuing exception. Um, do you have any sense of that? And, and do you, you sort of mentioned the Congress's view, but I don't think you gave us what you think is going to happen in the executive world. Um, I mean, I think that the next administration's early uh, months in office will be dominated by what to do about Iraq. Uh, and um, uh, and that most of these other issues are not likely to you know rise to high levels during that period. Um, uh, I think clearly the you know it, it, it depends in part obviously on which uh, d Democrats or Republicans. The Democrats are probably more sympathetic to UN peacekeeping and the funding the UN, which incidentally we're again not doing, um, and uh, and to and to strong multilateral approaches. Republicans would probably be um, not necessarily adverse to that, but put greater emphasis on uh, on, on nationally led coalitions or alliance led coalitions of the NATO sort. Um, the The fact that we're engaged in two large counterinsurgency campaigns is likely to skew debate because the Defense Department defines stability operations broadly to include counterinsurgency, whereas you know, I would argue that, a, that insurgency is what you get when your stability operation fails um, and that the objective should be to uh, establish a, 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 a secure enough environment so that you either deter or co-opt sources of violent resistance, which is the more normal approach and, and, and more normally successful approach. Um, and that counterinsurgency, while it has many similarities to peacekeeping or or uh, stability operations or even peace enforcement has one very different characteristic. Um, the characteristic that marks peacekeeping is that it's a function performed by foreigners, by definition. 
in societies that have lost the cap capability of securing themselves. And so if it's not going badly, more troops is a good answer in a peacekeeping environment. If you're in a counterinsurgency environment in which you're facing uh, rooted, organized, violent resistance, then history suggests that, uh, that these uh, campaigns are usually won only by indigenous forces, which may be backed up and supported by external sources, but that the capacity of the indigenous actors is the most um, decisive component of success or failure. And so in that kind of environment, building up indigenous capacity and, and, uh, uh, and, and not relying heavily on, um, on uh, foreign, and in this case American forces, is, a, is usually a better prescription. Um, I, I, I do think that the debate will be very confused because of the, of the dominance of the Afghan and Iraqi paradigms. And when you talk to, you know, when you, go, when you go around the government today and you talk about how to improve our performance in nation building, it usually translates into how to improve our performance in counterinsurgency operations because that's what they're, that's what they're doing. That's what's demanding. And that's a perfectly appropriate um, uh, concentration, um, but there's this whole other field uh, of uh, operations which um, uh, uh, largely avoid the need to escalate to the counterinsurgency level, and learning how to do those better may in the long run be even more important. In a way, your, your answer leaves, leaves open the, the, pro, the prospect or the possibility that after we've had a counterinsurgency period, there may be another peacekeeping period so that the level of forces, which needs to be significant for the initial peacekeeping, and then if you fail at that, you enter into a counterinsurgency where you don't want a lot of forces, but then you've established order again. Are we going to look at that? And this, is that one of the prospects that we have facing us? Well, certainly the issue of the size of the U.S. armed forces will be a major question that will, or that will face the next administration. Um, uh, and uh, there's been a modest increase in uh, end strength under this administration, and there are many on both parties who argue that it's not adequate. Um, uh, and even if you would, uh, and certainly the demands of, if not peacekeeping operations per se, are not very demanding in terms of manpower because they assume a permissive entry and, a, uh, and, and the acquiescence of the parties. And uh, success rates are pretty high for or operations that are manned fairly lightly. Um, peace enforcement, on the other hand, is more demanding. And I'm not talking about counterinsurgency. I'm talking about using force to stop an ongoing conflict when the parties don't want to stop. Um, and so that's a kind of Bosnia or a Kosovo situation. And, uh, uh, and, and it was the prospect that faced us both in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and the, the appropriate levels for that kind of operation are quite high. Um, uh, even if you're successful in co-opting or suppressing actual violent resistance, establishing adequate security in those kinds of conditions in which the indigenous actors are not capable or not willing to do so is, is pretty demanding. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, I would expect that one of the lessons that will emerge from the conflict in Iraq is that one has to be more discriminating about how often one does these. The fact is that um, Peacekeeping operations are feasible in well, fairly large countries. There's an operation in the Congo which hasn't been completely successful. I think the Congo has like 70 million people, but which has substantially reduced levels of violence there and allowed a, a free election to take place. Um, uh, but, if, but, but peacekeeping doesn't stop aggression. Peacekeeping doesn't stop genocide. Peacekeeping doesn't stop WMD proliferation. It will stop it from reoccurring but it won't stop it from occurring if it's ongoing. And if, if it's ongoing, you're going to need to go to the peace enforcement level. And, um, and that's very demanding. Um, and, uh, uh, and so you're only going to do it in cases, first of all, where the society involved is fairly small. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody's going to think about invading and occupying Iran anytime soon, whatever else we might do to them. Um, uh, so society has to be fairly small, and you have to care a lot about it. So we'll do it in Haiti, we'll do it in Bosnia or Kosovo, we're not going to do it in Darfur. And we're going to wait till the conditions of a peacekeeping mission, that is acquiescence of the parties, can be procured. Would you look at, when you look at a case like Darfur, there are people who would 
argue that if the United States had contributed 200 soldiers and, and significant helicopter airlift, that we might have then had the European partners and others that would have provided the necessary professionalism to have stopped what we have labeled a genocide. Do you, do you buy that? I haven't looked at it closely enough to know exactly what the numbers are. And admittedly, this schemata in which you have peacekeeping at one end of the spectrum and peace enforcement at the other, I can tell you what the numbers are for either one of those extreme mm -hmm. cases, that is, the ideal peacekeeping circumstance and the, uh, and the normal peace enforcement circumstance. And basically, one is 10 times bigger than the other. Mm -hmm. And we've done a study, and you need 10 times more mon and money and 10 times more men to do a Bosnia or Kosovo type operation than to do an El Salvador or Cambodia type operation. Um, uh, where does Darfur fit on the spectrum? If it's peace enforcement, they definitely don't, you know, the government of Sudan is going to resist and you're going to have to force them, you know, then you're off on a very high spectrum. If it's closer to the other end, they're not cooperating, but they can be persuaded and if there's enough international pressures, they can be brought along, you know, then, you know, then you, you may be able to move, bring the manpower uh, requirements down to what you've suggested. Certainly the fact that the U.S., of the 100,000 troops that are deployed, troops and, so, and police deployed in UN operations, 11 are American today. Right, right. 11, not 1,100, not 11,000, 11. Um, and certainly, and, and, and instantly, Europe isn't much better. Since the mid 90s, Europe and the United States both withdrew from, inter, from international peacekeeping. And with the exception of Lebanon, where there is a large European force, their numbers are almost as low, not quite. Um, and it's the rest of the world that are, that, are, that are performing this. And the fact that UN peacekeeping operations don't have heavily equipped, highly mobile, well-trained, um, first world contingents definitely does limit their effectiveness. And, uh, and it's, it's kind of ironic that the European Union have now put troops into Chad while we're looking to the African Union to put troops into Darfur. Now, probably both places deserve a peacekeeping force but some reversal of that particular prioritization would probably be, would make more sense. Uh, I'm sorry, just the last, my last question. Um, so sh should the United States be more involved than to, have a, to limit itself to 11 uh, soldiers out of 100,000? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think it's naive at the moment to think with the pressures on the U.S. armed forces uh, 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 that exist at the moment that we're going to put significant manpower into UN peacekeeping. Um, uh, we did uh, contribute um, to UN peacekeeping operations in the, in the early 90s in Macedonia and Haiti. Uh, both of those were quite successful in terms of the, the effectiveness of the operation. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, that kind of participation can both strengthen individual operations and provide a significant operational experience to American, um, uh, to, to the Americans who take part in it, which will have an important carryover effect in other environments, including ones that, that impose higher demands on the forces and which are not going to be carried out under, under UN auspices. So I think both in terms of the, uh, of, the, of the training and experience it would afford our own troops and the improvement it would make in, in UN peacekeeping, um, it, it would be a, a significant uh, plus. I'd also note that, uh, that, that at the moment, uh, you know, China is now the 11th largest contributor. It's, it's going way up in terms of contributions, and it's putting, places, uh, putting forces in places that both we and they care about, like, you know, like sub-Saharan Africa and resource-rich countries that are also very unstable. Now, I'm not suggesting this is a zero-sum game with China, uh, but I do think that if they have a national interest in promoting their, uh, projecting their interest, their, their influence in this manner and sustaining UN peacekeeping operations, it's something we ought to be keeping an eye on and maybe, um, and maybe we ought to be thinking of doing the same ourselves. Good, thank you. Uh, when, when I call on you, will you, when you ask your question, will you please identify yourself and uh, just take a second for the microphone. To, if you could bring a microphone right up front here. Uh, it, sometimes it takes a second before it catches your voice. Uh, so why don't we take this gentleman right here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Leonard Oberlander. I, uh, earlier in, in your remarks, you were referring to the relative successes or failures of uh, American efforts and, and UN efforts and, and, so, and so forth. And with, re with that, in regard to that, uh, 
this is a, a rather academic question about how uh, relative, those relative successes or failures were, were determined. RAND is held to a, a high standard of, of quality in its analyses and, and reports. Okay? <laughs> uh, so I, I'm glad I have the opportunity to ask you the, this question. Uh, across the board, what is your view of uh, the, the general population of studies, reports, that go to general officers, field grade officers, uh, the Pentagon, and, and so forth, and, and also UN officials. Uh, do these studies that have determined success or, or, or not success, have they developed good criteria? Are they measuring the criteria? Are the, are the, are the methods uh, of analysis and, and testing rigorous? Are there, uh, what, what sets of assumptions are used? Are they careful about that? And uh, are they assessments of the achievement of mission objectives? Or are they simply descriptions of outcomes that are judged to be successful or, or not? And could you? Well, there is a literature on this. I can't say I'm completely familiar with all of it. Actually, Rick has done more work than I have on metrics for judging uh, this, the progress of ongoing operations. I mean, our metrics were very simple. Um, I mean, one was, is there, is there a war going or not? The second was, um, was the government that's governing judged by the international community to have been freely elected or not? Another criteria is growth rates. You know, what's the GDP growth? If you want to, if you want to see how successful your aid has been, uh, you can't do it, you know, in a few months. But, but over time, uh, you judge GDP growth rates. And what you find, for instance, is that the Bosnia uh, reconstruction effort, which was so criticized during the 90s, is the most successful such reconstruction effort since the Marshall Plan, in terms of GDP growth rates. Um, uh, another uh, uh, measure of success is refugee returns. You know, refugee returns, first of all, are an objective of many of these operations. That is, we invade the country in the first place to get the refugees back in some cases. Um, and secondly, they're a good sign that security is improved. So you can take, we've got 23 cases now in these various volumes, and we look at the rate of refugee return. Um, and uh, operations which are otherwise more successful usually also have higher rates of, of refugee returns. Um, now, not none of those really most of those don't tell you whether at that moment what you're doing at that moment is succeeding. They're retrospective uh, and, um, and, and uh, what's harder to grasp are metrics that tell you whether the, what you, the change you introduced last month is it beginning to have you know, the desired effect and that's obviously much more difficult and it's not something I personally have worked on. Yeah, I would just uh, quickly add to that that most of the work we've seen has been extremely self-centered so almost everybody reports that their program is a success. Uh, we've been confused how 100 successes don't add up to one big success, <laughs> uh, which would be the natural uh, equation and in, 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 uh, certainly mathematical equation. And also, there's a lack of independence. Uh, there's a, an emphasis on what has been spent, uh, resources d dedicated, and, almost, and we almost never look at it in terms of the effect on the people who are living in the country we almost always look at it in terms of our effort. So there are uh, some, some heavy institutional weaknesses that tend to be reinforced by our bureaucratic uh, rewards. And so it's an area that could quite easily be improved. Uh, yes, why don't we go back to the back row here, uh, that distinguished uh, white-haired guy. <laughs> hey, Don. Hey, Rick, Jim. Don Presley with Liz Allen Hamilton. Jim, when we were looking at Bosnia, police force was a big issue, and we didn't seem to have within the United States a uh, capacity to uh, mount quickly the level of police that was needed uh, to get beyond military and, and to help uh, stabilize that. State Department's now talking about a civilian reserve corps. Do you have any views on, on those two aspects of uh, being able to provide civilian resources um, in the uh, in a uh, post-conflict situation, well, police are uh, police are a critical um, potentially and and and, and uh, desirably civilian component of a mission, and the U.S. really led the way in uh, in the 90s in demanding 
um, the deployment of large numbers of armed, empowered police. Hitherto, the UN had only employed, only deployed unarmed police advisors with no executive authority. And the U.S. said that wasn't enough, and in Haiti, we deployed a thousand uh, armed international police in Bosnia using the UN, but to our uh, they deployed 2,000, which unfortunately the Europeans and the UN insisted should be unarmed, which reduced their effectiveness. In Kosovo, we won that argument and deployed 5,000 uh, international police. Again, under the UN organized them, not us, but, um, but we provided 500 of the, of the 5,000. Um, uh, and, then this, and then this is one of those discontinuities. This administration completely forgot and didn't deploy a single civilian policeman in either Afghanistan or Iraq. It's deployed retired police to do training, but it hasn't deployed any armed, empowered police in either, and it hasn't asked the UN to do so in either case. Um, now, you can argue that it's too violent, and probably by now that might be true, but it wasn't in the initially, and it wasn't part of the initial plan, and it's just another example of this discontinuity. But if we've forgotten what we learned in the 90s, the UN hasn't. The UN now has a, 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 a standing rule, in effect, that one man in 10 should be a policeman in, a, in an operation. So at the moment, the UN has 90,000 soldiers and 9,000 police deployed. Um, and that's, a, that's kind of their standard approach, is to have about 10% of the force be police. The US difficulty in deploying large numbers of police, of course, is derives from the fact that we don't have a national police force of any size. I and mean, we've, got, we've got two or three dozen small national police forces. In fact, we've got two dozen just operating here in Washington. But, but, but none of them are, are, are large enough to deploy thousands of people to, uh, to these kinds of environments. Um, uh, and so we're reliant on state and local police, and, and, and we use contracting uh, vehicles rather than actually bringing these people into federal service. And, deploying them as federal employees uh, uh, under this. And I do think this is one of the areas that could be fixed. Um, the approach that the, that the uh, State Department is taking of creating this civilian reserve strikes me as better than nothing, but not entirely adequate, because the civilian reserve is likely to be fully deployed within you know, six months of its, of its uh, creation. And, and then you'll be back at the same thing of what do you do for the next mission since you've already deployed deployed everybody to the last mission. Um, I do think a system which allows us to bring state and local law enforcement uh, personnel who volunteer into federal service and then allow them to return to their local law enforcement agencies without any loss of seniority uh, or, or, or um, promotion prospects uh, is important. At the moment, they have to leave their old force. They, they, lose, uh, uh, they, they lose the chance of getting promoted. They lose seniority. They may not be rehired. Um, uh, they're not sure whether their health and other benefits will continue. And so something that fixed that problem would make it a lot easier to generate the kinds of numbers that we need in these missions. Let me get one over here. Yes. Uh, Jim, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I just wanted to suggest uh, Could you, uh, just for a, Please identify yourself as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Howard Wiarda from CSIS. Uh, I just wanted to suggest uh, to you and your team, which you may have considered already, a couple, a couple other ways to cut this. Uh, one is to distinguish between developed states and third world states. Mm -hmm. And there the question is, is the experience of Germany and Japan uh, after the war really relevant to under-institutionalized, right. low-income countries today. Uh, the second issue is what uh, social scientists call path dependency, which means the, in, the past institutional history. And the argument being that a country like Germany or the Czech Republic, let's say, uh, was relatively easily able to achieve democracy because they had an earlier experience with democracy uh, before uh, World War II. And the third issue, uh, which you might consider, and maybe there's too few cases for that, uh, you didn't quite break it down by region or by culture area. And probably, if we had enough cases, uh, you could make a consideration that in some areas of the world, nation building is, is likely to be more successful uh, than others. Like America, maybe because of its past history and its proximity to the United States and our leverage 
in that part of the world, Eastern Europe, because of its proximity to the East EU, uh, to the EU. Uh, I wonder if you might comment on a couple of these dimensions as well. Thank you. Well, I, I think that this is actually something I'd like to do. Now, I would say, in partial defense, I mean, I, I agree that Germany and Japan are uh, only have only limited relevance, and in fact, one of the main flaws in this administration's approach to Iraq was to uh, establish as its model going in uh, Germany and Japan. I mean, if you look at their rhetoric, you know, uh, they, uh, they established Germany as the paradigm and uh, for their operation in Iraq. Um, and, and you can understand why. Germany was very successful. Bosnia and Kosovo were less obviously or less completely successful. Uh, but the main reason probably was that the success had nothing to do with Bill Clinton and therefore <laughs> sort of politically safe. Um, uh, they weren't going to go out and say, we're going to do just as well as Bill Clinton, but they could go out with good conscience and say, we're going to do just as well as Douglas MacArthur or Dwight Eisenhower. And so these were models they could embrace. But of course, uh, Iraq in 2003 looked a lot more like Yug Yugoslavia in 1995 than it did Germany and Japan in 1945 that were homogeneous societies without any significant sectarian division. divisions, first world economies, and they both surrendered. Uh, neither of which was true of either Iraq or Yugoslavia. Um, uh, it, it's also true that you can't uh, you, you can't uh, measure uh, success in uh, Liberia by saying, well, it doesn't look like Germany. Uh, it, it, you know what you're trying to do with these societies is make them look like their neighbors, not you know their neighbors who aren't in civil war, not you know Switzerland. Um, and so uh, it, it, you know you know we don't invade poor countries to make them rich, or authoritarian countries to make them democratic. The international community puts troops in violent countries to make them peaceful. That's your, that's your core objective. Um, and if you achieve that, you've achieved the reason you deployed forces. Now, you still want them to develop, but that's not why you sent troops in. That's not why you deployed forces. Um, and in the cases I named, the 15 cases I've named, they're peaceful. You know, they're not Switzerland. But they're doing as well as their neighbors are doing, um, who haven't had a civil war. In fact, in most cases, economically, they've had higher growth rates than their neighbors. Um, and they've, for most cases, they have more democratic governments than their neighbors now. I don't know how long those will last, but th there is a good deal of literature that says that, that, that post the post-conflict environment is an important opportunity to break uh, 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 particularly um, poor states out of the traps that they're in. That, that they offer you the capacity to, uh, to, to uh, break a lot of the institutional and cultural uh, 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 constrictions that are keeping that country poor and authoritarian. Um, uh, but I think you're, uh, you know, we have, it's true, our studies have tended to look at these operations from the standpoint of the international community, looking at inputs, outcomes, and you know what worked and best practices. And I think it would be useful to go back through the same 23 cases and try to categorize them, not by external externalities, but by indigenous circumstances and how culture and geography um, and economics um, and, and economic circumstances affected the outcomes. And if anybody has funding for such a study, I'm more than happy to conduct it. I actually think we'd be more capable of doing that. <laughs> 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 yes, Dane. <laughs> That's only if the funding is available. <laughs> Dane Smith from CSIS. Going back to the Civilian Reserve Corps, uh, in the FY09 budget that's now before the Congress, $249 million proposed for the Civilian Stabilization Initiative, which has been described by Secretary Rice as creating a civilian expeditionary surge capacity. Uh, I'm wondering whether that kind of rhetoric isn't uh, basically uh, likely to create the kind of allergy to uh, further adventures abroad, uh, which I think you would like to avoid while uh, not taking into account the points that you've made that we need to keep developing our capacity in this respect. Um, yeah, possibly. Um, uh, I, I mean, clearly the that particular rhetoric is geared to current circumstances, current exigencies, 
um, and, uh, and, and, it, and it may be geared to current congressional uh, requirements. Um, uh, the, the question is, how do you mot motivate the Congress to pay for these kinds of things? And, um, uh, it, it, but it's also quite possible that with a change of administration, the rhetoric will, will change and, and, and one will try to propose a different, um, a, a different rationale for the same thing. Personally, I, I would prefer, I don't have anything against the Civilian Reserve Corps, um, but, uh, but I, I think the real lack is in uh, full-time career personnel, particularly in AID, um, secondarily in the State Department, not in you know, people who can be uh, mobilized for short periods from other agencies or other walks of life. I mean, the real loss has been the loss, particularly in AID, of the professional capability, not just to contract for these kinds of activities, but to oversee them and actually conduct them. Um, uh, if you look back at the number of people AID and state were able to deploy in Vietnam, for instance, in the 70s, um, it's considerably larger than the entire worldwide uh, 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 staff of both agencies at the moment that were deployed just in Vietnam. And so there's been a, a major drawdown, particularly on the AID side. And I. I would be putting, um, uh, that's where I'd be putting my resources. Let's get one over here. There, do you want to go? We've got so many questions. I, I'm, I, let's do this one right here. You want to group and then, and then let's group then let's group about four or five because we're just not going to get through all of you. So I'll just sort of do a cluster, a cluster, okay? There, you get the last one I want here. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I wonder, the fascination with stability ops uh, as a DOD core mission, there's a small group in DOD, um, maybe as small as just me, who thinks <laughs> that uh, stability ops applies to the homeland as well. I think after Katrina, that's exactly what was done. I wonder if there's any thought toward that. Um, I, I think it's true that, the, that, that there are those in DOD, and I think it's more than you, who want to define stability. Since it's a core mission, they'd better define it broadly. Um, and, and who certainly, uh, I think DOD would, uh, would define a hurricane or famine relief somewhere abroad as a stability operation, <laughs> even though it doesn't really involve anything more than just flying in stuff and turning it over to NGOs to distribute in otherwise basically benign circumstances. Um, uh, and, and, and I don't know whether they've made the case that domestic operations fall within this definition or not. Um, I, I, I would prefer a more narrow definition because I think that the requirements of uh, uh, establishing security in a, in a, in a transitional uh, environment and enabling non-military means to stabilize that environment is an important mission that we need to learn to do better. And if it's subsumed in a whole range of missions that have no important security component whatsoever, um, uh, I, I, I think we'll lose that focus. All right. Let's uh, when we get let's get uh, Derek and then this row. Are there other questioners over here? Why don't we do one, two, and then we'll pick the two of you off as well in this round. All right, Derek Brinkerhoff, uh, RTI International. Uh, one of the other controversies in uh, in this whole business is the use of contractors, and you haven't mentioned that very much. And I, I was wondering if. Uh, you could comment on, on that. I mean, some see this as a, as a problem of cost, others as effectiveness. Uh, Ashraf Ghani in his latest book, is, uh, as you're probably aware, is particularly critical of the use of contractors and, and not focusing on, on assisting the host country government. So I think this is another, another feature that, uh, that we need to take into consideration, thinking about the lessons and all. Uh, I mean, Hamid Arsalan, uh, an intern with PCR with Rick. Um, you mentioned in, that in the 15 countries that you mentioned, uh, among one of them was Afghanistan as well, that they are now more stable or there is, um, I think, uh, less violence. But in the real case, being from Afghanistan, that's not true because uh, since the, after the invasion, the level of violence has increased from 2003 to 2007. That's that is now threatening the central government and even the upcoming elections, for example, that they are coming in, in Afghanistan. So, and bearing in mind the foreign policy of the United States that they are not negotiating, for example, with terrorist groups, including uh, um, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, and uh, that the war basically 
is failing and the, 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 the international community, they are losing the support of uh, the people on the ground as well. So what do you recommend for the upcoming administration here in the United States? Do you think that is there any room for negotiations with the Taliban or something? And I, I, and I, I just uh, maybe a quick clarification on, on the part that what do you mean that is it stable in Afghanistan, something like that now? Okay, I'll read right here. Thank you. Um, Paolo von Schirach. On the issue of Afghanistan and Iraq, which you touched upon in, a, in your earlier remarks and, and during your presentation, just if you could um, elaborate a little bit on how you, from your vantage point, you, you can e explain uh, the time that it has taken to have a learning curve and this incredible mismatch between resources applied, goals uh, uh, projected and, uh, and proclaimed, and the inability, and in confronted with a manifest inability of securing them, just keep doing exactly the same things for three, four years, up until the point that we know, you know, change of leadership, betrayers, you know, DOD, et cetera. I mean, how can one explain that confronted with the practical experience of, of failure, or at least, let's say, lack of success, that it's taken so long to say, okay, we've got to rethink this, and maybe rediscover some of the things that we had forgotten about counterinsurgency in Vietnam and elsewhere. Because, I mean, the magnitude of the blunder is, is so huge that in consideration of the relevance of the strategic objective, that is certainly much, much more significant from every standpoint than, than Haiti or, or El Salvador or, or anything else, you know, many of the other examples that you have uh, cited with the exception of the end of World War II. So from your perspective, what explains the slow process of getting on to a different learning curve? Thanks. Let's do one more here, and then we'll, then we'll do a second shift. The, so we do the microphone, keep it in the neighborhood if that's all right. I'm Mitzi Wirth. I'm with the Center for Naval Analysis. Um, along with the learning curve, I want to ask about the learning curve in both the nation and in Congress. And what I'm struck by is, is how knowledgeable many people were in Congress when I first came to town. And now with the turnovers that we get, we don't build this cadre of people who really understand all these foreign policy issues. But indeed, unless they have support from home, they're not going to give us more money to go into state, into aid, into these, and fund these kinds of things. And I think that's, that's a serious problem that we face. Great. All right, Jim, do you want to take those four and then? Um, on contractors, um, I think you need, in, in, one needs to distinguish. Um, certainly, contractors have always been an important component of these missions, at least in the post-Cold War ones. Um, uh, after all, NGOs are contractors, or grantees, which is another word for the same thing. And they've always delivered all the humanitarian assistance. So, you know, in, in all of these operations, you know, the, the NGOs and, and, and uh, for-profit contractors play an important role and a not, un, uh, and a not, uh, and a not um, uh, inappropriate role. I think it can be taken too far. I think the U.S. government has lost some core competencies uh, by contracting out functions, including oversight functions that should be, uh, be done by U.S. government employees. And, um, and I would argue that, that, that we should claw back some of that competency into the government itself. I think you make the, the, another distinction is between armed contractors and unarmed contractors, and it's the armed contractors that have become more controversial, particularly in Iraq, where there are tens of thousands of them. Um, and there, uh, I think that first of all, it is a core competency that we're in fact contracting out security. Uh, but to the extent one believes this is desirable, we need to establish ways that that assure accountability. Um, for uh, people that we deploy, arm, uh, and empower. Um, in most of these circumstances, we've arranged immunity from local jurisdiction. And when we do that with armed uh, uh, contractors, we need to substitute uh, an alternate form of jurisdiction and accountability. Congress has tried to do this by arguing they should come under the UCMJ. It's not just a question of establishing a legal framework. It's establishing the practical requirements. So if you... You know, for instance, if you need uh, uh, 500 CID agents and 30 Judge Advocate General Corps people to handle military trials in Iraq for the military, 
and then you decide there's 20,000 contractors on top of that, you've got to take a proportional increase in CID agents and, and JAG officers to handle that additional workload and then tell them that, they, that they're supposed to go out there and find cases and prosecute them. So far, we haven't prosecuted a single case. Um, and uh, so it's, not, it's a question of, one, establishing the jurisdiction uh, and then, uh, and then uh, giving the agency that has jurisdiction the wherewithal to actually apply that jurisdiction. I think that's absolutely vital to the extent that armed contractors are going to be used in these kinds of circumstances. On Afghanistan, I don't think I said, I certainly didn't mean to imply that Afghanistan is a success. I rated it as a failure in the eight American cases, uh, or at least not yet as a success. I did say that our counterinsurgency uh, uh, tactics have become more sophisticated and I think generally more successful, um, but I don't think that it's, it it's yet turned the situation around. And I don't think it's going to do more than stabilize the situation at, uh, at unacceptable levels of violence until you deal with the situation in Pakistan, which you're not going to deal with through military means. But essentially the insurgency is equipped, trained, uh, recruited, organized, and directed from Pakistan. And as long as that remains the case, you're not going to be able to do anything more than to limit its incursions in Afghanistan. You're not going to be able to prevent them. Um, why does it take so long? I mean, there is great inertia um, and, uh, in government, in any government. Um, if you want to know why it took so long specifically with this administration, read State of Denial by Bob Woodward, um, which is a book about you know, why this administration denied patently obvious failure for a prolonged period of time. Um, if you want to know why it takes so long generically, there's a book that was written after Vietnam by Bob Comer, who was the top civilian responsible for all of the nation building in Vietnam. And he came back to Rand, in fact, and wrote a book called Bureaucracy Does Its Thing um, about how difficult it is to get agencies to adopt uh, priorities and manners of proceeding that are not natural to them. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think both of those illustrate why it's difficult this time and also why it was so difficult uh, last time. Um, I, I, would say on, I mean, on Congress and the public, obviously that is where the, the real battle has to be fought. Um, uh, it, it certainly didn't help in this administration to have an administration that said we're not going to do nation building. It's an inappropriate uh, 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 activity for American, uh, for American personnel. So it starts with an administration that's prepared to make the case, but even once the administration is prepared to make the case, it's a long, difficult road. Okay, why don't we take, I think that worked out pretty well. Let's take a round of questions right here in this neighborhood. It looks like there are three right there. Uh, why don't we start with the, the woman in the middle, please. Juliana Pilan, I teach a course on democratization at National Defense University and the Institute of World Politics. and. Uh, you may be interested to know I actually use your books, Great. but throughout this whole discussion <laughs> you have not used the term democracy building. I suspect that is probably deliberate, although in the introduction to one of your books you say that rightly they're sometimes used interchangeably. Of course, nation building is so much more innocuous, if you will, reconstruction, stabilization, very uh, ideologically free, shall we say. But democracy building, uh, even though to some extent democracy too can be understood as a process, uh, nevertheless it explains some of the nation destruction, for lack of a better word, that has taken place, uh, which uh, in Iraq specifically, that is of course controversial. Could you address the the big problem, uh, the Iraqi ambassador to the United States mentioned this recently, uh, we, we, we demolished some of the infrastructure, for example, in communications, and then it took uh, two years for American contractors to not really do it right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Michael. Um, Michael Lund, uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I wonder if you could uh, tell us uh, any lessons learned at the strategic level with regard to what sorts of main priorities seem to need be needed uh, at different stages in a post-conflict uh, uh, history. Um, and a, a common approach is uh, you know, to sort of list a 
all of the various uh, goals of security, democracy building, rule of law, economic growth, and so on, um, as if one can do all of them simultaneously, or one should put equal amount of resources into them at, at any stage of violence and, uh, or whatever in a post-conflict uh, scenario. And I'm just wondering whether any of your studies came out with sequencing, uh, right. lessons about sequencing and so on, because it seems to me if we're talking about interagency cooperation and wanting to engender that, in order to avoid a food fight, you need to have some sort of strategic vision of some kind, and I'm wondering if the lessons from the cases help us in that regard. Right. Alex, should be right there, yeah. Just, just pass it among yourselves. And <laughs> Uh, thanks, Alex Thier from the U.S. Institute of Peace. I think this was also a thematic grouping because <laughs> my my uh, my question is very much related to the last two about taking you back to this issue of objectives and expectations. I mean, particularly on Iraq and Afghanistan, we seem to have tremendously overpromised and underdelivered. And I think that part of that, as you rightly and always point out, is that we we didn't do it well. We didn't have the tools to to do it well. But there's also something which I think Michael's question is getting at, uh, and as well as the democratization question, which is that particularly in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, some of these objectives are tremendously difficult generational challenges. And our mindset is one of one-year rotations, four-year political cycles. And uh, you've talked before about the sort of, uh, not so much here, but about sort of the length of time it takes. And you look at Japan and Germany, you look at Bosnia, perhaps the relatively easier cases, uh, and, and see what an incredible amount of time and commitment it takes to stick with it and get those right. And it seems like, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan, our perspective has been such a short-term perspective, but our goals have been so awesomely uh, forward-looking and, and, and perhaps off-base as a result. And so I, I hope that, that you can say something about whether our expectations are realistic in these more challenging failed state environments. Um, and, and, and really getting back to Michael's question, if, if there is something that because of that challenge you have to say particularly about sequencing and prioritization of what we need to do to, to get on the right path. Since you've simplified the question form by bringing them all together into one, <laughs> why don't we take one or two more over here? If, are, are there any more over here? Let's get these, uh, let's get these three people here and then that's going to be it, I'm afraid. Yes, uh, this gentleman right here, please. Either, either one of you, yeah? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I'm Tony Sennett with Intera Solutions. Um, I noticed the Marine in the back of the room, and it reminded me that I was on General Frank's staff in uh, J-5 Plans and Policy ahead of the invasion. And um, so, so in Tampa and then later in Qatar. And... Uh, it seems to me that ahead of the invasion, some of us, myself included, noted that we were institutionally unprepared for the post-war situation uh, as a country. And um, it seems to me also, you may agree with the observation that a lot of the intellectual work that we did in Tampa was uh, summarily cast aside by OSD and certain parties within. Um, with, with an eye to that institutional uh, weakness. Looking at Goldwater Nichols and the requirement for joint service for general officers, flag officers, um, what about mirroring that and, and advocating a new act that um, imposes a kind of interagency service for people of other agencies? Why, why is there the overemphasis, in my view, on uh, DOD bearing that burden of cross-agency or uh, cross-attachment work? Um, and I wonder if you could further comment then on uh, two other aspects that seem to played out in Iraq specifically, um, which, uh, which would be uh, teaching people how to co-opt existing forces or existing institutions uh, rather than summarily dismissing police and armed forces and so forth and rebuilding from scratch. Secondly, um, employing uh, expeditionary commerce since we've not seen very much of the U.S. commercial presence in Iraq or Afghanistan except on U.S. government uh, contracts. And then furthermore, uh, the concept of constitution building and uh, 
building uh, or, or setting forth the intellectual underpinnings of democracy, if, if democracy building is what we're going to do. Because we didn't change the, fundamentally anything in the Constitution of Iraq. And I wonder what, uh, what you might uh, comment on as we move forward if we're going to contemplate any of these missions in the future. You, you may have asked uh, four questions there. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh, none, of them are, none of them are going to be very easy. We're going to have about five minutes to answer all of these, so please. All right, Tim Bennett, a very specific question. Um, as part of the nation building, the, the U.S. Uh, has often included foreign investment promotion, uh, including in Iraq, although I understand in recent days the U.S. is going to start shutting that down. Uh, the uh, Bosnia, the ill-fated Ron Brown trip. Uh, could you share your observations on whether or not it was practical in the way that was handled, whether or not there have been any successes uh, 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 in terms of the foreign investment promotion efforts? Good. Well, that's, you've, you've at least come back in on the expeditionary commerce question. That's good. Well, no to, answer? To, no, nice. let's see one last one. One more. Sorry, Jim. Chris Ho from the State Department, but speaking for myself. And this is a general um, issue that perhaps you can weave into your other answers, and that is uh, when you talk about 90s and Haiti and Macedonia as places where we put U.S. troops under a U.N. umbrella, we haven't done that for a long time. You're implying we probably should do more of that, and I don't disagree. But one of the things that's changed since then, it seems, is we now have a military establishment saying, these are part of our core option. So why should we go out and do it that way? We'll do it our U.S. way, which is, which is better. i um, not saying I agree with that, but I think that has been a real fundamental shift in the last decade where we now have a sense at DOD in particular, but elsewhere in our government, that this is not only something the U.S. has to do, but we have to have the Pentagon in the lead because that's the only place we've got the resources and the personnel, and increasingly people will argue the knowledge and experience. Now, I don't disagree with that, and I think there are plenty of people at the Pentagon who'd say, no, civilians, you have to get your act together and be there more than you have been. But nevertheless, there is, as we approach this, whether it's on the Hill or in some of these more institutional debates and applying best practices and so forth, the sense that if we're going to do anything serious, we're going to do it with DOD in the lead because that's the only way the U.S. can do it. And I'd just be interested in your thoughts on that. Okay, Jim, you have about five minutes to rip, okay. rip through these easy questions. Um, now, I mean, addressing the first sort of three questions that, that dealt with democratization and some and prioritization. Um, you know, as I said, you know, the, the core objective of these missions is not to make poor countries rich or even authoritarian countries democratic. The core reason that you deploy armed force is to make violent societies peaceful. And, and success is if you leave behind a society that's at peace with itself and its neighbors and stays that way. Now, economic and political reform are essential components of that strategy. You need to deploy both um, in order to succeed. Um, you know, there may be isolated cases, extremely rare, where there's some traditional form of governance that you can restore that's not democratic. Kuwait would be the best example. You go in, you liberate the country, and turn it back over to the royal family. That's feasible because you had a, a traditional form of government that continued to have legitimacy and credibility in that society, whatever you might think about it. The population was perfectly content to have the royal family put back. That's, that's extremely rare. In most cases, the reason that you're going in in the first place is that all traditional forms of, society, of governance have been discredited and collapsed and are not subject to recreation. And so you're going to have to create a new basis based on popular sovereignty um, to, uh, 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 to govern the place. And so political and economic reforms are going to be essential. But the objective of your political reforms is not, uh, is not abstract social justice. And the objective of your economic reforms is not just GDP growth. In both cases, what you're trying to do is, uh, is uh, rechannel the competition for wealth and power in that society from violent to peaceful means. And you, and, and you are trying to design uh, changes in uh, political and economic structures that uh, provide incentives and co-opt the various competing uh, factions in that society into forms of peaceful competition. Peaceful competition for money, peaceful competition for power. And you need to design uh, economic and political reforms with that objective. So you may well put your money not where it'll yield the highest GDP growth, because if you put it there, you'll actually be exacerbating some source of conflict 
favoring one faction over another and increasing the likelihood of recidivism. Um, uh, similarly, on the political reforms, you may not be looking for the absolutely perfect um, uh, political structure. You're looking for a political structure that yields legitimate governments based on popular sovereignty in ways that bring in as many of the factions rather than keep them on the outside. Um, there, the, the book that we did called The Beginner's Guide to Nation Building does establish a, a hierarchy of functions, which are not necessarily chronological. If you have enough money to do them all, you can do them all simultaneously, but, you, but they are hierarchical in terms of calls on resources, and so you don't resource the lower priority ones until you've assured yourself that you've committed adequate resources to the higher ones. So the top priority is security. The next is governance. I don't mean democratization here. I mean just getting somebody to pick up the garbage and turn the water on, um, uh, which you need to do sort of on day two. The next is ec economic stabilization. Again, it's not development. It's just getting a, a stable medium of exchange, reopening the markets, um, and allowing normal economic activity to return. Um, uh, the next is democratization. It's political reform. And the lowest is economic development. Um, and you should resource those in that hierarchy because if you don't successfully do the first ones, everything you succeed in the lower ones will be washed away. So if you don't establish security, all your political and economic reforms will go away like sandcastles on a beach. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, yes, you, you need to tie your ambitions to your level of commitment. You can achieve a lot with a lot, you can achieve a little with a little, but you can't achieve a lot with a little. And if you're going to go in with, 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 uh, uh, with relatively small light forces or in, you're in a very big society in which even large forces are dwarfed by the size of the society, then you are going to have to have strategies that focus on co-option rather than deconstruction. Look at the German and Japanese uh, uh, occupations, for instance. Germany, the strategy was complete de deconstruction. We destroyed every single national institution without exception. There were none left. Germany had no national government, 1945 to 1949, and every institution was created anew with no links to the old institutions at all. In Japan, we kept every institution. We kept the emperor, we kept the prime minister, we kept the cabinet, we kept the ministries, we kept the courts, we kept the police. All of them were kept. Nothing was abolished. Everything functioned from the day we got there with no Americans in any position, and they were reformed from within. And that went much more cheaply and much more uh, quickly. And we had 1.7 million troops in Germany, uh, just in the American sector. There were, there were more than 6 million troops in Germany as a whole. Um, and we had only a few hundred thousand in Japan. Um, uh, so, you know, there, is, there are big trade-offs there. Um, and and co-option, uh, even though it yields less perfect results, the German transformation was much more sub substantial than the Japanese. Even though it yields less substantial results, is much cheaper. Uh, and and is usually the preferred option for that uh, for that region. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, now I'm having difficulty uh, reading my. Um, well, yeah, sort of. Uh, let me skip that one. Maybe it'll come back to me what I wrote. Um, okay, I answered the co-option versus deconstruction question. I think um, on the issue of expeditionary commerce. Um, uh, I, uh, and, and, and there was a, a second question on that as well, an investment promotion. I'm skeptical that that's yielded very much. Um, we tried, we made a big effort in Haiti. It had very little limited impact and, and we put a lot of effort into it. Um, it, it never had much prospect in Iraq or Afghanistan. We even have a promotion zone in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, tribal areas in Pakistan, a, a less likely uh, you know, uh, focus for American uh, private investment uh, is hard to conceive. Um, uh, the, the basic, uh, uh, the, the, the basic uh, determinants of whether you'll attract foreign investment are A, security, and B, a regulatory environment that allows the investment to go forward with some assurance that it'll have a laying, level playing field. And both of those are, you know, those are top priorities. I said the top priority is security. And the third priority is economic stabilization, which again is not development, it's just reopening the possibilities for commerce. So if you create those conditions, you know, you don't have to fly people there, although you can, and, and if you have those conditions, then it's probably a good investment to put them on the plane with the Secretary of the Treasury or Secretary of Commerce and try not to fly into a mountain on your way there. Um, 
on uh, on constitution building. I wasn't sure. I mean, the the Iraqi constitution is actually pretty good, and and in fact, if you if you looked at the CPA's record, I think uh, giving the Iraqis a, a legacy of at least a decent constitution with um, is is probably one of their significant achievements. Now, the fact that it doesn't function very well is another question. But but the the constitution that's emerged from that process is 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 not bad as a uh, as a uh, as a document. Um, uh, on the uh, on the on the issue of you know whether we should do it our way, you know the real question is how much of it we want to do. Um, in Bosnia, the American troop contribution was 22 percent of the total. 78 percent were contributed by our allies. In, uh, and, and the money situation was similar. We, we only contributed a fourth of the assistance. In Kosovo, we got that down to 16%. Only 16% of the troops were American, and similar amount of money. And yet that was enough for us to dominate both operations and, and largely determine their course. Um, uh, in, in Afghanistan, the numbers are much higher. There's more than 50% American, and in, Af and, in, and in Iraq, of course, it's 95% American. Those don't strike me as models that we want to replicate. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I think we want to return to the more traditional emphasis on burden sharing and, um, and uh, multilateral approaches. To do that, we have to adopt institutional mechanisms that are compatible with everybody else's. If we have a way of doing things that's incompatible with everybody else's, we're going to create barriers to multinational participation. If we use troops to train police and everybody else uses civilians, it's not impossible for us to cooperate, but it's going to be a hell of a lot harder. Countries are going to resist it. The institutional networks between their Justice Department or Interior Ministries and our Department of Defense are going to be incomplete and uh, fraught with difficulties. And that's true across the board. So as we design our structures, we need to keep in mind the desirability of, of burden sharing and the need to be compatible with other, other actors uh, if we're going to minimize our own share. Now, um, uh, you know, I think that in terms of counterinsurgency operations in highly violent, difficult circumstances, you know, the, the multinationalization is going to be infrequent, and if, to the extent it takes place, it'll probably take place in an environment like NATO, um, where you already have a good deal of interoperability. But to the extent you're talking about lower threshold operations with lower levels of risk, like Bosnia and Kosovo, for instance, I think multilateralization and broad burden sharing is very feasible, um, and uh, and and those are the kinds of we should be we should be uh, our objective should be to hold uh, uh, operations to that level wherever possible, and to and to develop the capabilities that allow us to support operations that don't go over the insurgency threshold whenever whenever possible um, on cross agency. Uh, uh, training. I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that uh, uh, that one of the uh, innovations that ought to be introduced is a requirement that for promotion to senior levels in uh, in the civilian uh, elements of our national security establishment uh, should be a requirement that you have to have served one tour in another national security agency or in the White House. Do you want to do the default position of the of the Defense Department? Did you, did you answer that one? The last question. I think so. I think okay. that, that's what I said. I mean, right. I think to the extent that the DOD insists on doing it its way, it's also going, in, it, as a practical matter, is insisting on doing it alone. And I think they understand that. I mean, you're not going to get them to, you know, they understand, there's no hope of getting anybody to help them in Iraq. And so they're going to design U.S. only solutions for Iraq. Uh, it's important that we don't trans, that we don't port those solutions to other circumstances where a, a more multilateral approach and a smaller U.S. contribution is feasible. Okay, well, thank you. Let me, uh, let's all join in and thank Jim, but also this uh, entire program should be on our website within a day or so, Ian, is that right? And it'll be a video as well as a, as well as a transcript, or how does it work? Okay, so it'll be audio and video, and I, I particularly thought your answer on the democracy question is worth uh, everybody going to the website and listening to it again since you crammed so many answers in. At, right at the same time. Thank you all for being here and thanks to